Yep, it's recording. I mean, so. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Digital Pathology 3.0, brought to you by Thai Global Health. I'm Dipti Desai. I, I along with Jesse Danjal from New Jersey and Vineet Patni from Pune, co-chair the Thai Global Health Initiative. As you all know, healthcare is undergoing a renaissance and technology is revolutionizing healthcare through AI, blockchain, telemedicine, AR, VR, robotics, and more. The Thai Global Health Initiative through these webinars is discussing how these adopters of tech in healthcare are transforming the industry today. Here you will have the opportunity to hear from innovative solutions, challenges faced, what is hot, what is not, and get to know how the digital tools, wearables, medical devices, telehealth, 5G, mobile, and AI powered systems are being used to streamline workflows, optimize systems, improve patient outcomes, reduce human error, and lower costs through web and mobile experiences. You will have the opportunity to meet the innovators and connect with the investors that back these solutions. And as a Thai Global Charter member, you will get to connect with these disruptors and investors, make an impact and get your solutions adopted in this field of tech enabled health. Conversations will be led by some of the influential people in health tech through global webinars, such as the one today. So take, stay tuned for further news. Now for today's webinar on digital pathology 3.0. Before I introduce Abhi, who will be moderating the session today, a few housekeeping rules. We want to keep this session interactive. So please submit any questions you have in the Q&A box that's below. And Abhi or I will curate these questions and pick them to be addressed by the panelists. For those of you who do not know Avi, and I'm sure there's just a few here because everybody here knows Avi, he's a charter member and board member of Thai Silicon Valley. He will tell you a little bit more about Thai. He graduated from Pune, India, and is an alumnus of IIT Mumbai and Stanford Graduate School of Business. He was the co-founder of BioImagine, which was acquired by Roche Pathology in 2010, and is now a founder of OptraScan, a new age digital pathology company. With 20 plus years of experience in product and people management, RB excels in the life sciences industry. He has several research papers and 17 patents to his credit. Having worked for both Fortune 500 enterprises and startups, RB takes an active role in designing and implementing business strategies, plans, and procedures. He has over 10 years of experience in technology solutions with AI at its core. So please join me in welcoming Abhi as the moderator for today's session. Welcome Abhi and over to you. Thank you so much, Dipti. And uh, uh, very good morning to all our viewers from California and uh, good evening to our viewers from other coasts of uh, this world. And uh, I'm referring that as uh, you know our entrepreneurs and our our pathology groups from India. Uh, I know it's very late for you guys there and it's too early for Californians here, but to accommodate uh, different time zones, uh, we thought of this as the right time for all of us to address your questions and discuss about what's happening around in this world of pathology. Uh, before I go uh, into the science and technology, let me address uh, some of you uh, by means of our tie, which is a strong platform, you know, making it available, a lot of technological initiatives to a lot of entrepreneurs like all of us. So Thai was founded in 1992 in Silicon Valley by a group of uh, successful entrepreneurs, corporate executives, and senior professionals. Over the last 25 years of existence, uh, Thai chapters around the world have become a vibrant platform for entrepreneurs, professionals, industry leaders, investors to interact with one another and thus forge long lasting relationships. We are very happy to arrange today's webinar on Digital Pathology 3.0. We have wonderful speakers today heading respective initiatives at leading medical devices and diagnostic companies. Webinar viewers are free to ask their questions and as Dipti mentioned, you know, please keep on sending your questions and we'll keep on picking those questions as we go towards the end of this session. So before we begin with our uh, discussions today, let me welcome uh, our first speaker, Michael Rivers, who is a president and life cycle leader of digital pathology at Roche Tissue Diagnostics. 
He is also a president of Digital Pathology Association. Our next panel speaker is Dr. Andrew Beck, co-founder and CEO of Path AI. Andy is a well-known pathologist and PhD in biomedical informatics from Stanford University. And our third speaker, Mr. Pavan Singh, he is a vice president of Leica Biosystems, uh, and he is heading digital pathology initiatives at Leica. Before we get into more Q and A's and try understanding uh, from our uh, honorable panelist, let me give you a little bit of background about what is digital pathology here, just to set the stage for all those uh, Thai members and Thai viewers who have never got exposed to this science called as a pathology in a digital format. So digital pathology is transforming the use of optical microscope. And optical microscope, as you know, it plays a very key role in diagnostic and research towards oncology, infectious diseases, inflammatory diseases. Now, all of us must know that unlike your cell phone, unlike your cars, unlike your laptops, which got transformed in last 20 years. Microscope is a hundred year old invention that is still using the glass slides to view the biological samples. You know the radiology, which has become filmless, and, but pathology is still not gone glassless. Digital pathology enables this transformation with improved tools to digitize, analyze, share, and store these images. So digital pathology is a wonderful field mainly, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a recent development happening over the last one or two decades that lots of players are trying to look at this as one of the business opportunity. And I wish some of our entrepreneurs from Thai Network also join this ecosystem to add a significant value, may it be in the device space, may it be, may it be in the AI space, may it be in the story space. So let's try to understand from our some of the different segments of the pathology industry that what's happening around in this world. And let's try to create a vision for digital pathology 3.0 as we end this webinar over the next 60 minutes. So Michael, I would uh, actually for ask you uh, the first question. And uh, that question is like, you know, digital transformation of pathology began happening in early 2000. I mean, you guys acquired us as well as Ventana Medical Systems. So, and when I say us means bioimagine, and then, you know, Pavan, your company Leica, they acquired Aperio and that's where you know, the companies like Roche and Leica, kind of the big players, started looking at pathology as one of an opportunity. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, how is this transformation happening over the period of time? Yeah, uh, so thank you, Abhi. Uh, if the, uh, first of all, let me, uh, let me say thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I, I think this is a, a fantastic topic. Uh, it's very exciting to talk about um, digital pathology 3.0. I think it's very timely. And, um, and I appreciate you bringing together such a great group of, uh, of panelists and, and colleagues to talk about this. Yeah, in, in terms of vision, I, I, I agree with you. We have been and continue to be on a journey um, of digital transformation uh, of tissue diagnostics. And I think you said it well, but just, just to reemphasize for, for those that may not be as familiar with this space, um, today in pathology labs all across the world, when tissue samples come into that lab, either from a surgical resection or from a biopsy, that tissue is processed and fixed and then sliced very thinly and put on glass slides. And then those slides are stained to highlight morphology um, on the tissue or to uh, highlight uh, biomarkers of interest that will help the pathologist in the diagnosis. And that diagnosis, as you said, it is done purely with a microscope and a subjective interpretation of that stain. It's, it's really amazing. I, I think tissue diagnostics remains the, the most important diagnostic modality that has really been untouched by, uh, by digitization and actually largely by automation as well. There's a tremendous opportunity, I think, to bring the benefits that, that come with this to this space. And I think the time is now. We, we have been on a journey. Um, there have been a lot of start, stops and starts um, along the way. But I think as we have seen the technology mature, uh, over the last decade uh, or two, and then the advent of uh, tremendous, uh, tremendously powerful AI tools, um, like the ones that Andy and his team are, are, are working on. I think the benefits of those two things together um, really offer us the opportunity to bring value to the pathologist that we haven't been able to bring before. And I would just say, um, I have to say, in the, in the current context of a pandemic, I, I think it also highlights the, the value of being able to digitize these workflows, offer them remotely 
to uh, the pathologist uh, where they can operate safely and, and securely from really anywhere in the world. I think all of these things are, are combining to make this the perfect time to, uh, to drive digital transformation in pathology. So I know we at Roche are very committed to that. Uh, we're very excited about that. And I really do believe that we will look back uh, on, on kind of this year, these years as the inflection point uh, of that transformation. Excellent. Yeah, I think that that gives you know a lot of good insight, and uh, I'm sure a lot of our chai entrepreneurs will also get uh, motivated to you know hear this uh, thought. So, uh, Pavan, you know, uh, since you come from Leica, and Leica is another uh, significant leader who looked at uh, digital technology in those early days by acquiring a company Aperio, and uh, Leica, you know, being itself a leading microscopy company, how do you guys see this uh, digital transformation or this digital avatar of pathology? Sure. Thanks, Sabi, for the <clears throat> introduction. Good day, everyone, and thanks, Ty, for hosting this as well. So it's great to be here. Great to be with uh, Michael and as well as uh, Andy here as well. So just to build on what was being said, um, Leica Biosystems, uh, as many of you know, we are a cancer diagnostics company. Our mission is advancing cancer diagnostics. And uh, when you think about the world of cancer diagnostics, uh, pathologists, they play a very central role in that entire process. And uh, what we're talking about is really enabling the pathologists to be able to operate in a, in a modern digital uh, environment, the traditional, like you said, the traditional workflow using glass slides on a microscope, that doesn't lend itself very nicely to easily sharing and collaborating with others and uh, using digital tools. So digital pathology fits very nicely in that realm. And that's what we are all about. If you look at the history of digital pathology, it has made very good inroads in terms of life science research, uh, uses in educational applications, where the penetration is still limited, despite many efforts, is uh, in the clinical workflow. And we are starting to see that change, and we are very excited about that. As digital pathology gets more and more adopted for clinical workflow, I think there's uh, just sky is the limit in terms of uh, what it can do for pathologists, what it can do for cancer care and the patients. And that's what we are really excited about, and we are starting to see that shift starting to happen in a big way now. Yeah, very good. So, uh, you know, while medical devices companies were looking at uh, this market need to offer instrument and then the software and then the workflow, uh, I think, uh, Andy, you are a company uh, and, you know, you being a, a co-founder of the company, uh, I would say that you took this initiative of analytics only offering, right? I mean, leveraging the AI tools. And I'm sure that's because you yourself is a leading uh, machine vision uh, and uh, machine learning expert uh, during your you know, bioinformatics that you did a lot of research at Stanford. Uh, can you share your vision, you know, looking at this whole industry more from the analytics only perspective uh, by trying to be, you know, maybe agnostics with the hardware players? Sure. Um, and thanks again for this great session. I'm really uh, excited to be a part of it. And I mean, I think it's only analytics only from one point of view, which is of course Path AI's point of view, but clearly it's really important we're part of this you know, ecosystem with hardware, with workflow, with pathologists, and most importantly, you know, with patients. Um, and this idea of sort of patient first and what problems do they really need solved? And sort of going backwards and finding you know, where are some of the gaps in the industry and some of the opportunities based on recent technology advances to fill that in. And that's kind of how we came upon our area of focus and prioritization at Path AI, we sort of recognized there, are, there has been incredible progress in whole slide imaging technology over the past two decades, um, led by many people here on this webinar and companies they work for. Um, and there's also been massive advances recently in fields like cloud computing, which just give access to computing resources around the world that would have been completely impossible 10 years ago. Um, so those are two pretty big developments. And the third big development sort of outside of say Path AI in general is just deep learning for computer vision. There's a lot of hype around AI and the word AI now is used all over the place to refer to all sorts of things, which is great and fine. But the area where we've seen massive improvements over the last 
10 years, uh, most recently, maybe the last five or six years, one of the big ones is computer vision. It's sort of, you can't argue with the fact that computers driven by deep learning um, can identify objects and images they couldn't before. So kind of putting all those pieces together is kind of like what's missing. Well, what's been missing in digital pathology is the actual software platform to bring all those pieces together and build tests and validate those tests in a way that will improve outcomes for patients. So we thought as a company, you know, our area of focus will be putting together the team, building the partnerships, and then building the technology that can, uh, can enable us to build and validate tests to really make an impact for patients. Um, and I do think this, like, like Mike mentioned and Pawan mentioned, these things coming together, I think, will be an inflection point where um, we do start to see new diagnostic algorithms that really improve patient care. Um, and once that happens, uh, you know, I think there'll be improvements for patients and we'll see, uh, you know, more wide uptake of the technology around the world so that as many patients as possible have access to these new advances. Sure. So if you look at, you know, digital pathology, I mean, why at all people would digitize the glass slide, right? I mean, either for the purpose of archival or for sharing purposes or for analytics purposes. And I think uh, what you are looking at more from the analytics perspective, but then Michael, what's from your perspective, you know, where is the pain point? Is it like a clinical diagnostic side or the research? Because people are talking about this digital transformation uh, for a while. And, you know, all of us are now, you know, discussing about the inflection point. So from your perspective uh, or from the Roche's perspective, how do you guys look at these two different segments uh, when it uh, comes to digital pathology transformation? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question, and I appreciate the, the focus on pain points, because uh, obviously, as we talked about, we, you know, this digital pathology is not a new idea. And in fact, this session, we're, we're calling it 3.0. That, that implies that there was a 1.0 and a 2.0 before it that didn't quite hit the mark. And, and so, you know, I think for me, so first of all, to your question, Roche is really focused on the clinical side. Um, there, it is. Uh, digital pathology has very important applications on both research and clinical, and they're not fully exclusive at all. I think it's uh, I think it's important to have a continuum of solutions across um, uh, across those two areas. But I think the opportunity is really in the clinical space, and I think that's where the pain points have been and where we have really fallen short. And it's been a combination of factors, but for me. My focus tends to be, and our focus tends to be on the workflow for the pathologist and ultimately the experience uh, that the pathologist um, has as they use the solution. And, and up until very recently, I, I just think that experience and that we have not brought enough value to the pathologist in that, um, in that process. Uh, the workflow has been slow. Um, it's been laborious. It's been expensive. Uh, IT complexity has been a challenge. All of those things. The good news is the IT issues and the product issues, I think, are all resolving in the right direction. Then we have the promise of value coming from these wonderful AI tools, deep learning, et cetera, these algorithms that, that Andy's talking about. And I think the combination of those things and, and then a workflow that really is tuned and built for the digital environment, I think, has the opportunity to give the pathologist tremendous value. And that's what we have to do. And so at Roche, we're, we're very focused. On, on the software solutions that enable the workflow for the pathologist, enable them to have a, uh, an experience that, that delights them and makes them want to give up their microscope and, and move to the digital space and see the opportunities that come with that. That is really where the focus is. And I think that's where we'll win and, in general. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then just to you know, uh, add to this question, uh, from the regulatory perspective also, right? I mean, you know, like, uh, the pain point that probably you would like to address also a little bit when you talk about the regulatory focus, uh, you know, and, and also the diagnostics need. Can you elaborate a little bit on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that and, and maybe Pavan wants to, wants to enter in as well uh, or Andy, but um, certainly there's been a regulatory barrier. And, and I think, I think it's important to, to note a couple of things. Um, it's important that we that we are build we are building diagnostic tools uh, for the clinical space. So it's important that we we build them in a way that is that are safe and and uh, effective and and so forth. The regulatory environment is very different um, in different countries around the world. So we're also all building global solutions, and um, 
and I think in particular, I, I think um, the FDA has, has taken a very conservative uh, approach to this, but, but um, I see them as being very uh, welcoming and, and, and proactive to, with this technology. They just want it to be implemented in the right way. And, and, um, and so that has historically been a barrier. Um, I think we've seen um, many recent examples of, of how that has been overcome, and, and I, see, I see tremendous opportunity and collaboration, I would say, with the regulatory agencies as they, as they become more and more comfortable with the uh, potential of the technology, the safety associated with the technology. And then I think it's, a, it, it's incumbent upon us as the, as the manufacturers to build solutions that, um, that are robust and, uh, and, and transparent, that, that you know, and, and then ultimately are delivering value. So I think the regulatory landscape has been challenging. I, I'm very optimistic about the path that we're on in terms of, uh, of the, our ability to overcome that barrier. I don't think that's gonna hold us back at all. And in fact, we've seen uh, most recently, we mentioned uh, the, the, uh, the issues that we've been having with COVID-19 and so forth, but that has also, um, I think, provided an opportunity and, and the FDA and CLIA and other regulatory bodies in the U.S. have stepped up and said, hey, we're going to create an environment that is more friendly to digital pathology um, um, as a solution and as an aspect of this telemedicine that we've been talking so much about. So tremendous opportunity and I think good, good partnership with the regulatory bodies. I don't know, Paulan, if you have any uh, thoughts about that. Yeah. And maybe, Paulan, like, you know, uh, as, as Michael is uh, rightly pointing to you, I think a uh, few days back when we were chatting, uh, you did mention in the same context, uh, you know, that uh, telepathology is now something that people have realized and, you know, understanding very well. And also, I think, you know, since Michael has also mentioned about FDA here, uh, with FDA's uh, new uh, guidance, uh, you know, on letting pathologists access the images remotely for the uh, interpretation purposes. Can, can you give us a little bit more insight about your views on this whole telepathology segment? Yeah, so the benefits of digital pathology have been around for many years, right? We all know that. Uh, what COVID-19 has really presented is uh, it has unified many different groups and bodies behind one common purpose. And it's amazing what happens when everyone gets behind the same purpose. That purpose has been to help and enable pathologists to work remotely. Um, now we have all seen during the pandemic, the work of healthcare workers is uh, you know beyond uh, admiration. Everybody has been doing such a fantastic job all over the world. And pathologists are part of that movement as well. Uh, sometimes pathologists are the unsung heroes behind the scenes and they work very closely with infectious disease. Some of them have had to quarantine. Uh, some of them have had to take shelter in home. And during these times, the challenge has been is how do we make these pathologists uh, uh, productive and able to render their critical services because cancer does not unfortunately stop with or without pandemic. And so how do we keep the pathologists uh, productive in this time? Digital pathology is a, is a fantastic way of doing that. And it has been amazing to see how quickly all the agencies, CLIA, CAP, uh, FDA have come together to make amendments to existing regulations to allow for that remote digital sign out. And very quickly, we have received our own uh, FDA enforcement on top of our existing uh, 510K clearances and, and so forth. And, uh, and FDA has been working with all the different vendors. And so it's been really fantastic that uh, we are able to move as an industry and enable these things. And my view is, I think this is here to stay. I think what we have seen happen in the last few months, because many of our customers, many hospitals, many labs, are looking at these solutions, not just for right now. Um, it, is a, it is an immediate need, but they are also thinking about how do we build an ecosystem? How do we build a workflow that can withstand if there is a second wave or another wave of similar kind of you know, uh, epidemic or any other need where, where people have to work remotely and that can happen. Um, so, so I think this has been really uh, a positive change it has been something that is helping pathologists and this will continue and continue to pave the way for more digital pathology adoption. That's what we are seeing. So uh, to make this telepathology, uh, Michael, you have any thoughts to share? Okay. 
So, so Pawan, uh, in terms of uh, making telepathology uh, feasibility, uh, you know, making those infrastructure available, uh, letting people access it remotely, uh, and while we are focusing US as a geography, what are your views to go beyond US, right? I mean, you know, to handle telepathology maybe across the borders, and I can see one of the question, you know, coming from our audience, uh, Sanjay Arora, uh, he's talking about uh, how do we build a global referral network to truly leverage the full potential of such telepathology abilities uh, across the globe and which also can be affordable. Sure, I'll give my quick thoughts and then um, maybe others can chime in as well. Uh, cancer is a global issue, right? It's not a US issue. And uh, uh, there's a huge disparity in the availability of uh, cancer expertise uh, in terms of pathologists. We, we know the large majority of pathologists in the world globally are in the US. Uh, there's a deficit of uh, pathologists in many countries around the world. And, uh, and so there's absolutely a need across the globe for having access to pathology expertise. Digital pathology can be a bridge to make that possible, to connect um, you know, rural parts of Africa or smaller hospital and, and um, uh, cities in India or China and connect those, um, uh, those who need the most expertise with the best of the best in the world. And uh, you know, it's uh, obviously easier said than done. There are some challenges to doing that. The technology itself is there, but there are infrastructural issues uh, such as bandwidth. There are also um, patient um, privacy issues about sharing information. And then there are also um, these uh, contractual relationships that have to be facilitated. Uh, you know, this is not uh, just interacting with people on, on social media or Facebook. This is, you know, clinical um, interaction. So it has to be facilitated in a, in a structured and organized manner that is HIPAA compliant, that is audit trail, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, the need is absolutely there. The technology can bridge the gap that is there, uh, but it's going to take uh, an effort between, you know, vendors and providers and between the different parts of the world um, and we are seeing some, some progress. It's not just digital pathology. I think it would be remiss to say it is only a U.S. movement. Uh, Europe, we have seen being ahead of the curve in some ways because uh, it has been CE approved for many, many years for clinical use in Europe, and many institutions are doing some cutting-edge work. Uh, we have also seen many uh, uh, Chinese um, hospitals taking on digital pathology in a big way because they see a huge, uh, huge demand for patient care uh, in that area. So we are seeing some progress globally, but there's uh, still a lot more that could be done and that will be done in the coming years. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so uh, as we spoke about telepathology right now, and uh, you know, one of the reasons why digital pathology is taking the roots and growing uh, is also an ability to, you know, take help from the computers and algorithms to analyze uh, and interpret the pathology images. So Andy, I'll come back to you now on this uh, topic, uh, you know, with your expertise. Can you help us give more insight about how do you see this kind of artificial intelligence tools uh, getting used uh, within USA? And also I would request you to give us insights in like, you know, extending beyond US more from the rest of the world perspective. Sure. Yeah. So I think there are, there are these incredible broad opportunities for using algorithms to address real medical needs and uh, needs of patients in several different areas that, that ultimately I think will all spread around the globe because the core problems being faced are the same. I mean, you have a serious disease, you want to get the best treatment and pathology examination of tissue you know, is going to help you do that. And there are algorithms that can do it the most effective way. So it's not really a US focus versus a rest of the world. I do think these solutions, once they're created and available, will be globally impactful. So a few of the areas to think about in pathology, if you think about what a pathologist does. So one is diagnosis, and it's um, standardizing, making more accurate in terms of making sure you get the right answer for what the patient has, and then making expertise globally available, because essentially you can train these algorithms on literally millions of expert provided examples provided by thousands of different experts. 
So essentially at scale, a machine learning system can learn off sort of far, far more data than any single human could learn off of. So I think that's the big vision. And then once that's bound in software, it can be distributed everywhere. So there are certain regions of the world that have access to no pathologists. And once this technology is validated and globally available, essentially every region, say with access to the cloud or access to a device, if this is on-prem, will have access to the world's best diagnoses. And I think that's, we all see that vision and I think it's technologically achievable and I think it will happen. So I think that's the first is just the best diagnosis available everywhere in the world. And then, you know, the second big piece we focus a lot on is drug development, um, where standardization becomes very important because pathologies used in many serious diseases, including essentially all solid cancers, as the way we decide which patients to include in a trial. And for certain diseases, cancer in some cases being one of them, or disease like liver disease, assessing changes in pathology is used as evidence for whether the drug was effective. So we think just even in terms of standardization, quantification, precision, there's tremendous application that again, once it's validated and can be deployed, should improve the drug development and the predictability and the probability of success for say every solid cancer drug, every drug for disease like liver diseases. And that should get effective therapies to patients faster and just improve the speed and the statistical power of running trials. Um, and the third piece is not just sort of automating, standardizing, making more precise kind of what we already know, but as a discovery tool to identify in a new way, a data-driven way, what are the subsets of patients who may respond really well to a therapy that's ineffective for the population at large. And again, that can really help to get the most effective therapies to patients who actually benefit from those therapies. And this is another area we're very, very active in is how do we use machine learning to identify patient subsets who are the most likely to benefit from innovative new therapies? And then again, all of these tools, once, once the, the system is more at scale, could then be deployed rapidly and globally for, for diagnosis and really for precision medicine. Um, and those are, those, so I think due to, due to certain reasons, a lot of these things will start potentially in the US um, or in Europe and others, but I think at scale, and we can picture down the line, um, the real power is going to be able to distribute these globally to as many patients who can benefit as possible. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as you rightly pointed that um, uh, millions of data points uh, which are required to build this kind of the tools, right? Uh, but then essentially artificial intelligence and also the deep learning based technologies are mimicking human pathologists. But then with this kind of a significant data and training uh, that is required and uh, for anybody to build those algorithms, I think they have to have this ground truth available with them. Uh, so, so Pavan, how do you see a uh, role of uh, academic institutions or the medical centers in making this happen? And that's where I think the uh, collaboration between the academia and then the private partnership uh, will be of great importance here, right? Absolutely. The academic medical institutions, as you rightly point out, I mean, they have this unique uh, intersection that they sit on between clinical practice, research and education. And uh, many of them have, um, have really bright upcoming uh, medical fellows. Uh, many of them have highly experienced uh, clinical practitioners. Uh, they tend to have uh, uh, funding in, in many cases. So they absolutely have a, a critical role to play. And we've been working very closely with many of them around the world. Um, and when we connect that, you know, the, the role of AMCs to the power of AI, as Andy um, was, was saying, you know, we all understand the importance of data. Uh, data is uh, going to be the fuel uh, that makes the AI engine run. We need lots and lots of data to, to build AI uh, engines. We need a lot of data to train them, to validate them. And AMCs can, um, can play a big part in that. Many academic medical centers uh, they tend to be early adopters and innovators when it comes to any new technology. And uh, they have been using digital pathology for many years. So there are some AMCs um, that um, have a range of digital pathology data already, and they can use that uh, right away. There are many others, almost all of them have host and host of uh, 
archives of glass slides. So they have glass slides from decades and those glass slides could be, we have the technology to turn those glass slides into digital images and they can then be used to feed into AI data sets. So there's, there's a lot uh, of you know, great potential to leverage the power of AMCs to take data, to turn it into digital fuel for powering the AI uh, of the future. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Michael, do you see uh, AI enable digital pathology playing like a crucial role in the coming years? Uh, because, you know, there is also kind of a uh, underlying to that, right? I mean, uh, where pathologists would say that, hey, now if AI is going to take care of all my interpretations, what am I going to do? And uh, Andy, he himself being a pathologist, is he planning to replace pathologists? I mean, that's another thing. Uh, it's an extreme uh -huh. case of what we're discussing, but what's your opinion about, you know, this AI enabled pathologies, which are going to be a part of uh, companion diagnostic tools. Uh, are these going to really replace pathologies in the years to come? Yeah, so I, I think just a couple of aspects to your question. So first of all, short answer to that question, no, pathologists will not be replaced in the, in the years to come at all. And in fact, I, I mean, we have been talking a lot uh, this morning about um, the lack of pathologists in, um, in many countries, uh, pathologists being overworked, pathologists being unable to, to be present where the diagnosis needs to be rendered, particularly if you, if, um, if you go to, uh, to China, India, um, th there's tremendous opportunity and pathologists are just not present in a lot of these, um, a lot of these areas to make the diagnosis. So there's a hunger for tools that will, um, that will enable the remote pathology that we've been talking about, but then also the AI. And I, where I see the AI making, the AI tools making a tremendous difference, I think it's in kind of two, two broad categories. I think one is in efficiency. So I think really enabling the pathologist to focus on what they're really trained to do and, and to not waste their time, uh, waste their time, but, but to spend their time on those samples that are very easy to diagnose, very easy to screen, they can then focus on the more, uh, the more complex cases. So I think it's a screening tool, an efficiency tool. There's opportunity for artificial intelligence to make a huge impact and make the pathologist ultimately more productive. Um, I would say also um, just the ability for the, um, the digital algorithms to bring a higher level of standardization to the diagnosis and quantitation to the diagnosis. So I mean, pathologists are, are amazing at their ability to recognize patterns and, and see very quickly what's happening in the morphology of the tissue. But, uh, but machines are absolutely better at counting than, uh, than humans are, uh, no matter how good the pathologist is. And, and we're often asking the pathologist, and, and what I see, you know, when I look at Roche, uh, our overall solution, and, and we, we have a very strong presence in the tissue lab, um, and, uh, and a lot of work uh, done developing very complex assays. And when I look at the new assays that are coming, uh, the pipeline of, of assays that are being developed, multiplex assays that are looking at multiple biomarkers on a single piece of tissue that we think are very important enable, uh, in order to enable the pathologist to understand the, the tumor microenvironment and, and really choose the therapy, as Andy was talking about earlier, that will make the difference uh, for the patient the complexity that is coming is tremendous. And, and I think we are really reaching the limits of what, um, what a pathologist with a subjective review under a microscope can really reliably and consistently do. Um, I'm amazed at, at how, how they're able to do it and how good they're able to be and, and the training and so forth, but we're reaching those limits. And those new generation of assays that, that offer tremendous information I think will really require artificial intelligence-based tools to, to extract the rich information that is there in the tissue. There's tremendous information that is there that is powerful and can really impact the patient. Ultimately, we believe, and I certainly see for the foreseeable future, the pathologist owns the diagnosis. The pathologist needs to be the one that integrates all of this multimodal information about the patient and determines the right decision and, and path for them. These tools will enable um, that pathologist to make a better decision in a faster uh, amount of time for that patient, get them on the right treatment quicker and, and ultimately for a better result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andy, you have any thoughts on this topic? 
Yeah, I would just reiterate this idea of um, that I think, think even thinking about replacing the pathologist um, is kind of misrepresenting the pathologist or, or, or kind of a, a far too narrow of a definition. And I'm not just saying this for political reasons or the fact that I'm a pathologist. It's actually true. Um, people go into medicine to help patients and people go into laboratory medicine because the area where you're thinking of the most impact is, is helping to figure out which data to get from tissue samples, including blood and solid tissue. And then how to provide that, summarize the data from the literature, from PubMed, from molecular analyses, from morphologic analyses, integrate all that together and provide something in a digestible way to the treating physician to provide the best care to the patient. So historically, the pathologist has always been called sort of like the, the physician's physician or someone guiding the surgeon's hand, but it's this sort of like how to, this sort of data analysis center that isn't directly interacting with the patient, but is sort of the source of knowledge to go from all this information to specific binary decisions about treatment, no treatment, or which treatment you give. And as Mike said, that's only getting harder. We are lucky if we can automate a few pieces of it or create some AI powered companion diagnostics to answer very specific questions in the best way. But it's still the pathologist's job to figure out what's the right algorithm to apply to which slide on which case. And is this treatment recommendation going to be relevant to this patient? And how do I summarize all this complexity and provide it back to the treating physician? And that's in the case where we actually have a validated, say, automated or almost automated algorithm. But it's still just one step in a complicated medical process. So I do think the pathologists are going to see, you know, the need is only going to go up. The, the sort of supply demand um, sort of inequality is only going to increase because we're only having more treatment options and more ways of generating data and analyzing that data from patient samples. So I think the nature of the work will change tremendously and it will be more about data and analysis and software and integrating molecular with morphological with clinical. But I think the need of a of a physician who understands the medical implications, understands the data, and understands the strengths and limitations of the different evidence each piece provides is only going up. And, um, and I think pathologists in general will probably be very happy to not having to be asked to do impossible tasks that humans aren't well equipped to do, like counting the proportion of brown cells versus non-brown cells on a slide when there's 100,000 cells per slide and there's 100 slides to go through in a day. That's just not a task humans enjoy doing or are good at. Luckily, that's one of the few things computers uh, are good at or can be good at. So we want to build tools to really just make pathologists scale what they are good at even more and more and impact more patients positively. So the idea of automation is just a complete pipe dream of like having a, you know, a box that, you know, tissue comes in and report comes out. It's just, it's just not going to happen because there's no need for patients for that to happen. There's always going to be areas of value that can be provided. Um, and if not, then we're all in a good place because patients are just all getting the perfect treatment. We don't need any humans in the loop. And I don't think anyone's going to uh, mind that outcome, but it just seems unlikely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I pretty much uh, concur with your thoughts because uh, one of the uh, recent work that we have seen even, you know, using opera scan systems where it was mainly useful from the cervical screening perspective. Uh, where in the remote villages, it's difficult for the pathologists from the big cities to go. And again, I'm referring to uh, an, a project that the uh, government of India took uh, along with us uh, in India, where they asked us to set up the systems where the cervical screening now can be completely done by the systems. And that's where, you know, where the pathologists themselves cannot travel to those places. Now the data can come to them. And I think that's the beauty of telepathology. And then embedded analytics can really help in terms of handling more and more cases and samples in a consistent way. And you know, one of the one of the interesting uh, scenario. I was speaking at some conference few months back, where one pathologist said that he heard that you know, like if there are if there are three pathologists and if they are given the same slide for uh, diagnostics, you know, they come up with three or maybe four answers sometimes. And that is a kind of a subjectivity. And uh, that is where I think the AI tools or even the analytic tools can help to bring that standardization, as Michael was saying, so that you know it. it it becomes kind of a complementarity to, to pathologist uh, abilities to do the interpretation. So uh, on the same note, you know, like whole of this process, though we are trying to automate this process, and though we are trying to bring a lot of intelligence uh, in this whole process, I think one of the physical component that is moving in this whole process is that tissue biopsy or the cell smear, right? Which is still in a physical form. And uh, whatever you try to digitize, 
you still require that uh, tissue to be stuck onto a glass slide. And glass slide, uh, because microscope was used over 100 years, glass slide eventually got created as a mechanism to you know, put that tissue or the cell on that slide and put under the microscope to see it. So that glass slide is still playing a significant role. And during the introduction also, I, I did mention about radiology becoming filmless. But when will pathology become glassless, Andy? What's your thought? Um, I'm not sure I see that happening anytime soon. I mean, it's possible glass could be replaced with some other material if there was a reason for it in terms of cost or, um, or just ability to work with it or transport it. Um, but I mean, I think it's sometimes things that last, last for a reason. Um, so I think there is a remarkable amount of information maintained on, the, on a physical surface when you fix the tissue and formalin and cut thin slices. It's kind of like that's telling us something important. It's kind of like asking when will in-focus photos go out of fashion? People have been trying to focus their photos for a while. Maybe they will. But the reason we like in-focus photos is because you can see objects in it and you make intelligent observations. You have this whole history of patterns of what's important, what isn't. Sort of like fixing and, and uh, stabilizing t cells and tissues on glass slides such that you can take photos of them and see you know, where, what is what and where is it. Um, I think it's, it may just be a, a good substrate for the types of analysis down the line. So until there's a real problem that's being solved, um, I would think glass slides could be around for you know the next hundred years or be replaced with some other sort of material. But the overall process of cutting tissue into thin sections so you can visualize what's happening in them, um, it's, a, it's a pretty high bar for some competing technology to overcome because it offers the spatial relationships which are so critical, which you don't get in a lot of either single cell genomics or transcriptomics or bulk genomics or transcriptomics. For the example, the only thing that separates invasive breast cancer, which has a certain set of treatment recommendations and prognosis versus something like ductal carcinoma in situ is literally have the malignant cells invaded and are they now neighbors of the benign cells. Um, and if you grind up the tissue, you can't get that. You just, you just wanna look at it and see whether that's happened. Um, so unless there's kind of a reason for some competing technology to show it's superior enough to um, this tried and true method, uh, I think it could be around for a while, but you never know. Yeah, well said. Any, any pointers from you, Michael, on this? Glass list? Hey, I, Abhi, I, would, I, I, mean, I would just add, I, I think, uh, I think Andy's absolutely right. I would, I would just add that um, tissue testing is, uh, is everywhere. It's, it's available just about everywhere. It's pretty inexpensive pretty fast it's set up so it's, it's well established uh, as well and uh, and pretty accessible so so I do agree I think um, I think the the context uh, of the tumor is, is is certainly important and this is the place that you get that and uh, so I think it'll be with us for a while that's, a, that's at least our our belief so yeah so on this note uh, you know uh, I also uh, wanted to go into uh, that analogy where people used to say that you know radiology and pathology are the two sides of the same coin, and uh, people are we're talking that hey the insights from radiology should be made available to the pathologists and so on and so forth and and still I think you know those are still working in silos though those are still not talking to each other that effectively. So Pavan, do you have uh, any you know views on this like uh, how can we integrate this? radiology and pathology uh, interpretations so that it is beneficial to that uh, patient care. Sure, yeah. Uh, just before I answer that, I want to go back to what was said about um, AI and glass sure. lines. Yeah. Uh, I would echo, I would echo what, what was being said. You know, we uh, at Leica Biosystems, we very much view AI as a tool and an aid for pathologists. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of um, unnecessary to be thinking about human versus computer. It's really human plus computer that's going to lead to the best answer. And then as far as the glass slides, I, I totally agree with Andy. I think it's, uh, it's here to stay. Uh, one area where we could uh, make it easier is today, all the glass slides are stored and they're stored for 10 years, 20 years, uh, depending on the region of the world. And if we go digital, that is uh, one um, massive you know, cost and, and effort that could be alleviated by storing those uh, slides in a digital format. So that's one area that we could see glass getting replaced by digital, but I don't see, you know, like Andy was saying, uh, the initial workflow getting replaced. 
Um, so coming back to your question about rad pat uh, combination, uh, right? You know that could mean a lot of different things. Uh, you know, on one extreme end of the spectrum, uh, there have been people saying, you know, the the, the entire medical practice could be merged together. Um, to me, that's kind of an extreme view. I, I don't see that happening. You know, we have seen medical uh, science and medical practice get more and more subspecialized. Uh, it's really where we see things, you know, getting consolidated. So I, I don't think that's uh, really uh, on the cards anytime soon or, or ever. Um, but what um, there, there definitely is value in is uh, presenting clinicians with uh, relevant clinical information for decision-making for patients. So there are cases where uh, correlating and cross-examining the radiographic image against the tissue sample can give uh, additional insights to the pathologist or to the clinicians, uh, you know, whether it's uh, soft tissue or bone or thyroid or, you know, in some breast cases. Uh, it's not for every single case, but there are cases where uh, having that, that cross-reference information uh, can be value additive. And we, we will see that. We are starting to see that with EMRs. Some of the information is coming under one system uh, with the with the movement towards uh, uh, adoption of DICOM in pathology and, and PACS, I think those are enablers towards that. Uh, but again, we have to be pragmatic and realistic. I, I worked in radiology for 10 plus years. Uh, and uh, despite you know, DICOM and PACS, uh, there was a lot of uh, silos within radiology itself. Uh, uh, we had you know, clinical PACS systems that uh, you know, were housing uh, uh, one set of data and, you know, the, the cardiology packs did not speak with the radiology packs uh, very well and so on and so forth. So, so I think there are um, still, uh, even with packs and ICOM, there are silos, uh, not that they can't be overcome. We will see that. And that's where I see the radiology and pathology information coming together is presenting that data in those cases where it makes the most sense mm -hmm. through the use of uh, these, these technologies. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, one of the question I am seeing it uh, coming from the user, uh, and probably this goes to Michael. Michael, if you would like to take this question, and what uh, uh, JC is asking is that can you provide some example of uh, workflow efficiency or operational efficiency that digital pathology could enable? And uh, he is asking more from the context of a real life, real world example. You know, like how uh, this efficiency improvement are feasible and possible if you can cite some example, maybe from the developed world versus developing world? Well, I, sure, um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and, and uh, invite others to, to add as well. I think we've talked about some of those today. There, there are a tremendous number of use cases for digital pathology, and I, I think many of them can result in better efficiency. We were just talking uh, last week with um, a, a customer of ours in Spain, and uh, as we all know, Spain was hit very hard with, uh, with uh, the pandemic and, and, um, and they for a while sent all of their pathologists home to work remotely. Um, what they were, and they're using our digital pathology solution. It was the first time they really pressure tested the solution in that, in that environment, but, um, but it worked quite well. And in fact, they have many of their pathologists that are now adopting that as their main mode of working, even when they can come back to the hospital. And so I think from an efficiency standpoint, that's an obvious one being able to work remotely where you are. You, you know, those that are not familiar with the, uh, the process in the anatomic pathology lab, there's a tremendous amount of just transport of glass slides. And because of the, we talked about the fact that glass slides are with us to stay for a while, but because of the nature of that process, it, it really forces the pathologist to be present uh, where the slides uh, are produced or you, you get into a mode of shipping glass around uh, or using couriers or, or shipping pathologists around <laughs> to, to where the, the slides are. All of that is very inefficient. And, um, and I think um, it's an obvious uh, impact uh, for digital pathology. And again, uh, we're seeing that, um, we're seeing this kind of acute situation forcing people to move a little faster than they might in changing their practices and, and adopting new things. So that's that's an example there uh, in Spain uh, from a customer with remote pathology. I think the other thing that we're seeing, and I, I, I just I referenced it a little bit earlier, but um, really 
creating a digital experience and a digital environment that, um, that allows you to do things that you cannot do manually with the microscope. So very simple things like uh, the ability to um, look at multiple sections. You know, when you have a tissue block, you, you often cut multiple sections and stain these sections, these serial sections, uh, they would be called, with different stains. And the pathologist often likes to see um, the context of the, of the first stain, the H&E stain, the, the tissue morphology, and then see what's happening with the biomarkers on those serial sections. In a digital environment, you can align those sections, you can synchronize them, and you can view them all at the same time. You can, you can uh, dive into deeper magnification all at the same time, look at the same area um, on that tissue with multiple different stains. That's something you can't do manually. So I think those are examples that, that I think now uh, I think all of the manufacturers are doing a much better job on Roche is paying a huge uh, uh, investment and attention to how do we optimize that digital experience uh, for the pathologist to, to enable them to do things that they can't do uh, manually. I think that's where the efficiency comes from. Yeah. And uh, Michael, while we are on this topic, uh, you know, since uh, Pavan also spoke about uh, DICOM standards and... Uh, yes. I'm also seeing some of the questions coming from our development uh, group, uh, you know, different engineers who are attending these conferences, uh, web webinar. They're also asking about, you know, what's your view on the DICOM standards and the need of those in the pathology industry, which is like really awaited for so many years. Yeah. I think I will, and you know, it's been, it's been a topic for many years. It's tremendously important. And uh, I would say, I, I think this is one area that uh, the Digital Pathology Association and the ability for us, actually all of us on this call, uh, to work collaboratively at, at driving something that is beneficial for the industry. DICOM is a great example of that. Um, we still don't have a standardized format across the board, and this, this enables us to standardize the, the incoming image format. But, uh, radiology has had that for many, many years. It's been a little bit more difficult to implement in pathology. We're making great strides. I think there's been a lot of progress in the last couple of years to, to get us there. We're not there yet. Uh, but I, I would say uh, we're well on the way, and there's, there's really good participation and partnership to make that happen. I think it's tremendously important. We, we talked about the rich data that's needed to enable the AIs. We talked about the amazing data that's available in tissue. In order to unlock that, you have to be able to access it <laughs> um, easily. And so I think having a standard format is, is uh, one very, very important step there, and we're certainly committed to that, and I think there's been good progress there. Very nice. Uh, one question coming uh, from our uh, viewer, Devendra Deshmukh, and I would say that this question probably I will direct it to Andy. Uh, Devendra is asking that, you know, which new skills needs to be acquired by traditional pathologists to remain relevant in the digital pathology age? Yeah, so I mean, I think, well, one is you still have to learn like the basics of anatomic pathology. Um, <laughs> there's no getting around that. So I think you know, the base has to be, um, you know, a lot of the same skills before. So I think that's time well spent even to evaluate how the different systems work and to really have a, uh, a deep understanding of disease from the cellular and the tissue level. Like that's not going away, especially for training. But there's a lot now in addition to that, um, that I think is key. And one is just getting diving into this world and evaluating the different tools and really developing a point of view for, you know, what works, what doesn't work, why does it work, why doesn't it work, being able to evaluate medical evidence. So I think biostatistics and the assessment of medical evidence is, uh, you know, it's critical today, but it will be even more critical in the future to really decide which of these technologies really does improve outcomes for patients in a way that's worth it versus which are just a nice to have. So I think there's going to be separating the signal from the noise is really important. And at least at Path AI, that's our big focus is how do we really make a difference and generate the type of evidence that will be required um, to change medical practice. So I think, you know, deep, uh, a good familiarity with biostatistics, how to evaluate medical evidence um, and being willing to work and learn from other people, just this sort of like, uh, you know, beginner's mindset that you're, you're always learning. There's a ton to learn. I think historically one critique of pathology could be that it was a bit siloed or it was a bit its own special um, set of expertise. And there's a few, there, you know, there's seven experts and you go to them, but now it's like, we are a critical part of this sort of precision medicine community. So it's really knowing what's important to oncologists, knowing what's ultimately important to patients, uh, payers, 
the drug development companies, you know, building the therapies of tomorrow. And I think pathology, you know, once it's no longer so focused on all of the, the in a way, low, lower level details of classifying individual patterns could really make an even greater impact in the future by, um, by just becoming familiar with, you know, in this new world of genomics and transcriptomics and new therapies, uh, how can we generate the right evidence from tissue samples to best guide uh, the physician's treatment decisions? So I think focusing on that as the core problem of pathology uh, is a great place to start. Absolutely. And now that we have just uh, last one minute remaining in this webinar, you know, I would request uh, Michael and Pavan also to give your views on what's your vision? What, what do you see going to happen in digital pathology space maybe over the next uh, three to five years of time frame? Um, so I'll just be brief. And uh, I know you have some investors and innovators as well on the call. I would say I think we, we got to just try to embrace uh, digitization as uh, a workflow tool. Um, turn away from uh, glass and brass and, and try to use digital uh, images to help pathologists. And there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in terms of helping uh, those who want to do this. There's, it's, a, it's a big change, right? There's, you said microscopes have been used for over 100 years. So we are trying to disrupt uh, an entrenched workflow. It's going to require process experts. It's going to require uh, capital investment. It's going to require you know, IT specialization. And those are some of the areas where the investors and innovators can look at and see how they can, you know, be part of that, uh, you know. So that would be my, my vision and, and uh, my call to action to those on this call. Michael? Awesome. Uh, I think that's a great call to action. I, I think I'll just, uh, yeah, reiterate what we, what we kicked off the call with. I, I, there is a tremendous transformation that's coming to tissue diagnostics. Uh, it, it is digitizing. It will digitize. I mean, this is, this is going to be a high impact, um, in, incredibly important change. And I, I, we're right in the middle of it right now. So um, it's certainly an opportunity to get involved. I would also say that at, at Roche, we, we're looking at it bigger than just um, anatomic pathology. So there's, there's certainly the opportunity for digital pathology and to, to uh, digitize tissue pathology, bring these AI tools to bear, uh, you know, get a better, faster decision uh, for the patient out of the tissue. But I think the, the bigger context is that once you've digitized that information, then you can flow that downstream into these kind of broader clinical decision support tools that can integrate all this multimodal uh, information that is also digitized. Uh, you look at the genomics uh, data, the radiology data, other imaging data, uh, any other diagnostic demographic information, and, and you have the potential to really powerfully impact uh, patient care. So I think, I think in of itself, digital pathology is an important opportunity and will happen, but it, it is also a key to enable uh, this, this even greater uh, impact through digital transformation. Excellent. So on this note, I would like to end our webinar. And you know, before we end this webinar, I would like to thank uh, Michael Rivers from Roche, uh, Pavan from Leica, and uh, Andy Beck from Path AI to you know, spare their valuable time to brief all of us on this very interesting topic of me personally, because being in this industry for the last 15 years, uh, you know, it's, it's something which is very close to my, my heart. And I think you know, I'm enjoying the way the industry is growing, and I'm sure uh, eventually, this industry will definitely benefit the patient care and healthcare as such. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Vijay, uh, who has just appeared on the screen now. Vijay, Vijay is our executive director at Thai Global and a man behind all these activities that are happening. And uh, Dr. Deepti Desai, uh, my uh, close colleague at uh, Thai, Silicon Valley, helping Thai for several years. And I also appreciate and uh, you know, uh, really thankful to all our participants and audiences who made it happen. Uh, to listen to what we are discussing. So it was a wonderful uh, session altogether. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Hope all of you enjoyed it. We will soon be sharing the digital version of this uh, uh, webinar for your off offline reading, but uh, remain in touch. And if any of you get interested in pathology, I think that's what uh, is a big success of this webinar. And we would love to welcome you in this uh, ecosystem of digital pathology and uh, help us help you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.